Tell them, Tell them the truth. Good morning. My name is Jesse Lawson. Last year, on Thursday, March 2nd, one of my friends was killed in a car wreck. Many students of Pittsburgh High School may remember this accident. Josiah Fletcher was the first friend I had made in high school, and he was the first person I had met. This was the first death of somebody that I knew, somebody I had seen every day. This was the first, first time seeing how the death of somebody that so many people knew affected them. However, Josiah's celebration of life was not my first funeral, but it was the first funeral I had been to where I realized the effects it would have on me and the other people around me. Although in the previous funerals I had been to, I knew what was going on, I just didn't realize how it would impact me. Nobody ever talked to me about this sort of thing. When I was younger, I was four years old, my great-grandmother died. Instead of my mother explaining to me why my great-grandmother was going into the ground, she let me wonder why everyone around me was crying. Children are so much smarter than we give them credit for, so why don't we at least try to explain something like this to them? Why do we in the United States push through the thought of death away when it is a natural part of life? Different cultures celebrate life and past ones. For example, Dia de Muertos, or Day of the Dead. It's a two-day-long celebration, most commonly known in Mexico, where people will create home altars to remember the dead, to remember friends and family members who have passed on. This is a beautiful tradition that keeps memories of loved ones alive, something very well known all over the world that happens every year that allows people to talk about death. It isn't something that is suppressed in their culture. People often wonder what lies beyond life. The uncertainty of what lies ahead is what most people are afraid of. Everyone wants to know if heaven and hell are real, if you are reincarnated, or if you're simply gone. Unfortunately, we do not have the answers to the, those questions, but if we did, I believe we wouldn't worry so much about what is on the other side. But why should the inevitable scare us from living our lives to the fullest? Although it can be scary, it is the one thing in life that is always certain. In the movie, Patch Adams, Robin Williams' character states, what is wrong with death? What are we so mortally afraid of? Why can't we treat death with a certain amount of humanity, dignity, and decency, and God forbid, maybe even a little humor? Death is not the enemy. There are countless different responses on how you can deal with death. Most people know and understand the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But many people do not understand that these stages hold in our lives. Going a little deeper into each stage can help bring up a, a better understanding of why we might feel these emotions when something tragic in our lives happens. The first stage is typically denial. Not being able to come to terms with the incident that has happened and you just don't believe that it was real. Next is anger. Being mad about the situation. You don't believe that it's fair and it shouldn't have happened to you or the others who may be involved. Then you have bargaining. You'll find yourself making deals with yourself or God to undo what has happened to return something in return for something else like becoming a better person or going to church more. You'll commonly think about what could have happened and you'll constantly ask yourself what if as a way to avoid the truth. Most people commonly know the next stage as the part of grief everyone knows, depression. The heartbreak finally sets in and you realize the truth of the situation and it hurts. Finally, acceptance. You give, in, you give in and understand that what has happened cannot be undone and you will have to live with the harsh truth. It is incredibly common for people to jump between stages. Some may go from denial directly to acceptance without feeling any other emotions, but others can stay in a constant cycle of repeatedly going through these emotions over and over again. Cruise.org goes more into depth about the five stages of grief and how they can affect your day-to-day -day life when going through an upsetting time. Coping is the hardest part about losing someone. Even after you have finished the stages of grief, you still have to cope with the fact that that person will no longer be in your life. There are different kinds of coping, and it can be harder depending on the situation. Sometimes it varies depending on how often you see the person, how much they impact your life. But everybody is different. Losing a family member or a friend will be much harder than losing someone you barely knew, or someone you knew years and years ago, but they are not as significant in your everyday life. For example, while I was finishing this project, I had found out my great aunt died and I went to the funeral. Of course, it was sad to lose a family member and see people you know and love crying, but I never really saw her as much, so I was much less affected by the whole situation than others. So when I say losing a person you knew, just not very well, is not me saying they don't mean as much, they're just not as prominent in your everyday life. 
When a person has unexpectedly died, it can be shocking at first, which brings you into the stages of grief mentioned earlier. But once you have finally accepted your circumstances, and the most important thing you can do is allow yourself to not be okay. Talking to others about how you feel and coming up with a plan to continue your everyday life can be incredibly important in your healing process. According to online.grad.syracus.edu, goes into depth about different symptoms that a person may feel when going through these situations. Being able to talk about how you're feeling will help you recover faster than dealing with it on your own. Someone who has passed unexpectedly will be much harder to cope with than someone who is getting older and you know they are slowing down or if the person is sick. Coping while the person is still with you and once they have passed are two completely different things. Coping while the person is still with you is when you know they will soon pass, such as they have a terminal illness or they are just not doing as well as they used to. Purecremation.co.uk states that spending time with a loved one is one of the best ways to help a person cope. Even if it may seem harder if you are with them throughout the last days, not only will it help you, but it will also help them by letting them know some, that they don't have to go through their last moments alone. Allowing yourself to be upset will always help. Holding in your emotions about the situation will only intensify them and make the healing process so much harder and so much longer. There are tons of ways to help yourself through these situations, but it's okay to talk to someone about it. Parents, family, friends, and so many other people would be willing to help you. Everyone worries about losing a loved one or dying themselves, but there's a difference between worrying about something and obsessing over something. Some people do become obsessed with the thought of death. They are constantly worried about what is going to happen to them or how their life will end. This is called afterlife OCD. A lot of people experience this even for a short amount of time. It brings questions like, is physical death the end of my existence or will I continue to ex exist in some way after I pass? Things that can trigger afterlife OCD are learning about the death of a loved one, going to a funeral, situations that could lead to accidents such as an airplane trip, attending sermons where the main focus is the afterlife and the punishments that you may face. It is completely normal to have these questions, but once it becomes constant and reoccurring thing, it starts traveling to the compulsive side. These people will look for reassurance in pastors, parents, the Bible, the internet, and even prayer. The main thing that a person can do to get over these effects is to become, to become comfortable with the uncertainty. Slowly gaining exposure to different forms of triggers will help you understand that there isn't anything to be worried about. Tree My OCD states that reading obituaries, visiting cemeteries, watching TV shows or movies in which a death can occur, reading accounts of near-death experiences, and attending religious services. In time, a person struggling with afterlife OCD will become better able to accept uncertainty in surrounding their field, fears and their intrusive thoughts and doubts that will cause less anxiety. They also go more into depth about the obsessions, triggers, compulsives, compulsions, fears, and deeper explanation of what afterlife OCD is. A lot of people will have this and tend to worry about how they will die, and sometimes they will believe that their life will end horribly. But most people do not die in any sort of accident. After doing a quick survey, I've determined that most people are afraid of dying in a car wreck more than any other scenario. If you look at this pie chart behind me, you'll see that there are about 333 million people that live in the United States, which is represented in yellow. And out of those people, 6,102,936 were in a car wreck, which is represented in blue. Only 1.8% of Americans have been in a car crash. And out of those people who were in car crashes, which is still being represented in blue, only 39,508 ended fatally, which is being shown in red. Although 40,000 people sounds like a lot, if you put it compared to 333 million people and you do the math, that is less than 1% of die, people who die in a car wreck each year. USAToday.com goes more into the math and ex explains that only 0.6% of people die in a car crash, and that is the most prominent way that most people die unexpectedly. The chances of you dying suddenly before old age are very slim. There are always things you can do to prevent yourself from dying early, like wearing your seatbelt, exercising, eating healthy, and having regular doctor visits. Still, there are things you can do to shorten your lifespan, like doing drugs, eating unhealthy, and being reckless. Living healthy and taking care of your body is one of the most important things you can do. Death isn't something to be afraid of. Why would it be? Of course, there's never really a convenient time to die, but we all know that it's coming eventually. Something that everyone should understand is that death is not our physical bodies. It never has been. Death is something that happens when your physical body can no longer keep up with your spirit. So why do we sit around thinking about things that can happen to us when we could be living every day like our last? 
Mark Twain said, I do not fear death. I had been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience from it. There was a before you and you weren't there for it, so how would after be any different? Thank you. Thank you.